Happy Sabbath to you. We're here recording at the Hayward Seventh-day Adventist Church. We hope that in the near future we'll be able to resume services here in our church on Sabbath mornings, and my, we sure look forward to that. In the meantime, we're carrying on. We're not going to lose our faith or our faithfulness in our relationship with God, with his son Jesus. Let's pray and ask for the Holy Spirit as we begin. Father in heaven, we're just really thankful to you for all that you have done and continue to do on our behalf. Please bless us with the Holy Spirit now as we uh, worship, and we thank you in Christ's name. Amen. I would ask you to open your hymnals, but you probably don't have hymnals at home. We'll have the words on the screen here for you. But the hymn is Power in the Blood, hymn number 294. Let's sing that together. take up the last few verses of the 14th chapter of Revelation this Sabbath. But before we do, let's pray once again. Father in heaven, thank you for the book of Revelation. Thank you for its instruction, for its warnings, for the prophecies regarding the, the, uh, the times of the end. And uh, we're just really grateful we thank you that um, the, we have the Holy Spirit to enlighten us, to bless us as we study. We thank you for his ministry among us, pointing us to the Savior, reminding us of the sacrifice that he made on our behalf, and reminding us of all the other blessings from heaven. And I thank you that he reminds us and calls us to worship. And so we come with our weaknesses and with our sin. We ask for cleansing. And we ask that we may be accepted in your sight because of our wonderful Savior and what he has done for us. Please bless the congregation today. Those who may not be feeling well, uh, be with them each one. We pray for our country, with all the issues that are racking our country now. We ask that your spirit will continue to abide in the hearts of, of the, those who have placed their trust in Jesus and may the Spirit restrain the powers of darkness a little longer. May your people rise to the work and the challenge that is ours and that is before us of sharing the good news and uh, then ourselves being ready and living in a state of readiness for the coming of Jesus. And we know that day is coming soon. Now be with us, Lord, as we study 
the, these wonderful verses here at the end of Revelation 14. In Jesus' name, amen. And there's one more item of business I'd like to take care of before we get into the text for today. And that is um, we want to wish the fathers who are watching, fathers of the congregation, a uh, very happy Father's Day. We're very grateful for all fathers, but particularly for fathers who have chosen to, to have Christ in their hearts and are choosing to walk in the footsteps of Jesus and to lead their families in the same, in the same uh, path. I want to greet you and wish you God's blessings. Uh, I think of uh, Joshua, the, the great leader of Israel who took over after the death of Moses as he stood before the people. He said to them, you know, you've got a choice and you can make whatever choice you want. He encouraged them to follow God and then he made this declaration about himself and his family. He said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's been my goal and I pray that it's yours. We cannot accomplish it in our own strength, but we can lay hold upon Christ and invite his spirit to live in our hearts and then through us may be accomplished the purposes of God in our family. Let's, let's determine that we'll love our wives, we'll love our children, and we'll encourage them to follow Jesus and to be, to be good men and women in Christ. All right, so happy Father's Day. Let's go to the Bible. We've been looking at the three angels' messages in the um, verses 6 through 12 of Revelation 14, Fear God, give him glory, worship the creator in the first angel's message. The second angel's message de declaring the fall of Babylon and then blending that with Revelation 18, an invitation to flee from Babylon with all of its wickedness. And then the third angel's message, do not worship the beast, its image, do not receive its mark. And then the, there's a description of those who live in the last days described as people who have patience, who worship God, who keep his commandments, and have the testimony of Jesus, the faith of Jesus. All right. Now we're going to go on to the last part of Revelation 14. And um, just following the third angel's message, we have these interesting words, this blessing. All right. I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from, this, from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that uh, they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Well, we don't know for sure that the first voice was that of the Spirit. Certainly the Spirit spoke. It's almost like there's one voice and then, and then the Spirit says, oh yes, and by the way. <laughs> but it might be the, vo the voice of the Spirit throughout. But what a, what a wonderful promise. In other words, you know, um, we're all going to die unless Jesus comes. There's, that's for certain. But there's a special blessing on those who die from now on. As it were, as the three angels' messages are proclaimed, that those then who fall asleep, they are waiting for Jesus to come, and they long for him to come. They declare his coming with the warnings and instructions found in the book of Revelation centered in the three angels' messages. But they fall asleep, okay? But there's a special blessing. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. I found this interesting statement. Um, a, a comment by this wonderful author, Ellen White, in a book, Early Writings. She says, there was a mighty earthquake, speaking of the, the time of the return of Jesus. The graves were opened, and those who had died in faith under the third angel's message, keeping the Sabbath, came forth from their dusty beds, glorified to hear the covenant of the peace that God was to make with those who had kept his law. So apparently they're going to come, come out of their graves just a little ahead of the others and see the very final events and, and uh, leading up to the actual return of Jesus. Wonderful blessing, a wonderful promise for those who who have fallen asleep in the third angel's message. Obviously, I hope to live to see Jesus come. I don't know if I will or not. Maybe it'll be in the time of my children or maybe my grandchildren. But uh, I want to keep before them the wonderful messages of this great book of Revelation and the promises associated with it. All right. Now, there are two harvests in the last part of Revelation chapter 14. All right. 
two harvests. The first harvest we'll look at now, the second harvest in a few moments. John said, I looked and behold a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, clearly Jesus, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Now today, a lot of people, you know, a sickle is something foreign, <laughs> especially to people who live in cities. Now what is a sickle? Well, um, let's read on. We'll talk about that uh, in a moment, okay? Another angel. Okay, so we have this one angel uh, that, uh, I'm sorry, we have the Son of Man here. Then we have an angel. There will be a, a, a second angel as well. So the angel comes out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, and for the harvest of the earth, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he, sat, he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. All right. Um, so here is a sickle. Actually, in many parts of the world, the sickle is still used to harvest grain, whether it's rice or wheat, so forth. Um, having um, grown up in India, I, I, it was a common sight uh, for me as a boy to see people harvesting their crops with sickles. Uh, it, was, it was very often the ladies who did that. Um, I remember as a boy, I was probably seven or eight, I'm certain I was at that age bracket. We were in the, in the town of Rurki where there's a Christian school. My parents were involved in the school. And we went out on the field to help with the harvest. The school had some acreage. And I remember being handed a sickle, seven or eight-year-old kid, you know. And, and so I tried to copy the example of these, of these people that, that bend down, grab a, a, a bundle of grain, and cut it off at the base with a sickle. And I did it a few times, and, you know, my back hurt, and I was just a kid, you know, lithe and, and uh, <laughs> youthful. But after a few, a few swipes, I gave the sickle back and said, thanks a lot. <laughs> And here they do it all day long, a sickle, an instrument of harvesting. Now, in time, as time went on, they found other ways to harvest. This is a scythe, as it's called. Fortunately, we have found ways to harvest grain that are much more efficient and even air-conditioned. So here we have a harvester going through a, a field of wheat, and they take care of a field of wheat in no time at all. But the point is that we harvest the grain and we collect the grain in bins, in trucks, in, you know, maybe cloth sacks, and that's wherever, wherever we are, we collect the grain and the rest we throw away. So the angel says, thrust in your sickle and reap. Now, I am certain that this is speaking of the coming of Jesus. And I love to review the wonderful promises about the return of Christ. They will see the Son of Man coming on the cloud of heaven, Jesus said, with power and great glory, and he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect, that is, the ones who belong to the heavenly family, who love Jesus, from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So it's like the angels are going out with the, the, their own sickles because... Revelation pictures Jesus as holding a sickle. He's there to reap, but he sends out his angels who actually do the gathering of the righteous to be with him. All right, the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Death is swallowed up in victory. This all takes place when Jesus comes. The dead who have loved him, the infants of, of families who have served Christ, that is, the families have and babies die, are all going to be reunited at that time, a great and wonderful harvest for the, for the kingdom of God. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So again, caught up. It's like the grain that's been chopped off and picked up. Even so, the righteous will be picked up in the air and taken to be with Jesus. All right, wonderful words, all right? Jesus said, don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am there you may be also. Once again, he's coming 
to get us. Like the farmer harvesting his crop, taking it to his storehouse, taking it to where he lives. All right. So, thrust in your sickle and reap, and the earth was reaped. Now, the second harvest involves another angel that I mentioned earlier who comes out of the temple in heaven. He, has a, he also has a sharp sickle. All right? And a third angel then, another angel comes out from the altar who had power over fire, and he cried with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth for her grapes are fully ripe. In the Bible, not always, but in several passages, grapes and the vine and the juice are linked with, shall we say, the other side. The wheat are gathered into God's storehouse, so to speak. They represent the righteous. But in, in some cases... In the Bible, the, the clusters of the vine of the earth and her grapes are fully ripe and so forth uh, speak of the wicked being fully committed to wickedness and suffering, shall we say, the trampling that comes because of their wickedness. And we're going to look at a few passages from particularly the Old Testament in this regard. All right. Well, let's read first the, uh, the, uh, the last part okay, of this section. The angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trampled outside the city and blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridles for 1,600 stadia. Well, uh, that last part I'm not 100% sure, but certainly it reflects or represented represents the trotting down and the destruction of those who have given themselves over to wickedness, all right? And it's like this, uh, it's the grape juice, or in this case, blood flows out for a long distance, uh, perhaps as far as 307 kilometers or 184 miles. It's, a, it's, it's not a pretty picture in particular. Okay, so let's talk about this. The wine press of the wrath of of God. Isaiah says, Why is your apparel red and your garments like one who treads in the winepress? And then answering for God, he says, I have trodden the winepress alone. I have trodden them in my anger and trampled them in my fury. Their blood is sprinkled upon my garments and I have stained all my robes. For the day of vengeance is in my heart. And the year of my redeemed has come. Interesting that in the midst of this language of punishment and crushing of the wicked, God also brings in the picture of his saving kindness and his redemption for those who accept it. Okay? I looked. There was no one to help. I wondered that there was no one to uphold. Therefore, my own arm brought salvation for me, and my own fury had sustained me. So we have both salvation and anger going on at the same time in the heart of God. Now this is a subject of, that's <laughs> been discussed a great deal. The relationship of God's wrath to his mercy. Does he even have wrath? Um, and so we'll explore that a little bit. But I just want you to see that in the writings of Isaiah you have both, both aspects of his character, so to speak, just mingled and, and freely discussed by the prophet. He's got the one, he's got the other. See? He's um, the day of vengeance, his own fury. I trod down the peoples in my anger, made them drunk in my fury, and brought down their strength to the earth. But at the same time, he could speak of redemption and salvation. See? For those who have chosen him. The prophet goes on after that very interesting dis uh, description of God's dealing with the wicked and with the righteous. The prophet goes on saying, I will mention the loving kindnesses of the Lord according to all that the Lord has bestowed on us and the great goodness toward the house of Israel, which he has bestowed on them according to his mercies, according to the multitude 
of his loving kindnesses. Now, while I have a very great interest in the subject of the wrath of God, I want to assure you that I want to spend more of my time being grateful, as the prophet was. I want to be among those who mention the loving kindnesses of the Lord. Those who speak of his great goodness and his mercies and his loving kindness, once again, you see. I don't shy away from talking about the wrath of God, but I hope, what, I hope to keep it in balance, see. And I want those around me to know that I have enormous confidence in God and in his love and his goodness, and it's been growing through the years. I hope it continues to grow. But I also want my understanding of God's displeasure with sin, his tremendous holiness, and therefore his, you know, he, he can't have sin around because he is so deeply committed to his own principles of purity and, and righteousness. All right, then to uh, Deuteronomy. This is actually the Song of Moses. In the book of Deuteronomy, he has preached a series of sermons, it appears. And then at the end, he sort of sings a song to his people. And in the uh, 32nd and 33rd chapter, uh, 32nd chapter of Deuteronomy, verses 32 and 33, we have these words as God speaks um, through Moses of warning to his people to his people, that is to the Israelites, that if they choose to turn from God, there are dreadful consequences. And so the prophet Moses encourages them to be faithful to God. And he goes up, he says, he speaks this way about the, the consequences of turning from God. Their vine is the vine of Sodom, and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall, their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of serpent, serpents and the cruel venom of cobras. All right, let's go on. Lamentations, as the prophet Jeremiah and his associates grieve over the, the city of Jerusalem that has turned from God so tremendously, so drastically. All right? The Lord has trampled underfoot all my mighty men in their midst. He has called an assembly against me to crush my young men. This is like the, they're, they're weeping over the dead of their people in the city. To crush my young men. The Lord trampled as in a winepress the virgin daughter of Judah. So this, this picture of trampling the, the grapes is a picture of judgment. Okay? So we have the great winepress of the wrath of God. There are many, particularly in the last maybe 150 years or so, and even today, who think that the idea that God gets angry is a primitive notion of God. Something that we might expect from the, shall we say, primitive authors of the Old Testament, but hardly worthy of Jesus and the New Testament authors. I have uh, done a lot of reading on the subject of the wrath of God and uh, ideas associated with it. And the, the idea that God is angry and has to be appeased and that there has to be a substitute, substitutionary language uh, involving the death of Jesus and so forth. They, they say, no, 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 no. That's all very primitive, you see. That's what we expect from people way back then. But today we're much more modern, up to date. Our view of God is that he is a God of very great kindness, and of course he is, but uh, we don't want to talk about the wrath of God, see. And so that um, the, this idea of, of Jonah on his trip, you know, he's sleeping in the bottom of the boat, and the, 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 the crew wake him up and say, hey, you need to be praying, you need to be calling out to your God, we're in trouble. I think I'm reading between the lines correctly. When... I picture these, uh, these crew, crewmen, they're thinking, man, we must have done something. Somebody on this boat has some, done something really terrible because that's why we have the storm. <laughs> and that kind of thinking was quite common back then. You know, if there's a lot of lightning, well, you know, the gods must be really ticked. And if there's famine, 
well, we just haven't sacrificed enough animals to the gods to make them happy, and so they're withholding rain and, and you know, making our crops fail because we have not been worshiping the gods as they want us to, you see. And what, what fascinates me is that the great God of heaven, merciful and kind as he is, sort of played along with this whole thing. They cast lots in the boat, okay? And the lot fell on Jonah. I think God had his hand in that. It's just really fascinating to me. And what happened when they finally did throw Jonah overboard? The sea became calm, and we read that these sailors were in awe, and they sacrificed sacrifices to the great God of heaven. Now, I would like to think that this incident caused maybe some of them to become true uh, believers in the true God. I don't know. I have no idea. But um, back in those days and in and, 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 and many places even to this day, there are those that uh, look upon God in that way. If we don't, um, if we're not careful, he's going he's to lash out at us, you see. So, we've neglected the gods, they're angry. We must sacrifice to them to propitiate them. That's a big word. The idea is to sacrifice to whoever's up there in order to kind of make him happy, sort of calm him down, and maybe the crops will get better and there won't be so many storms and all that kind of thing, okay? So we are no longer punished by storm Famine, war, and other kinds of things, all right? <laughs> so we have anger and wrath on one hand, and the way to get rid of anger and wrath from whoever's up there toward us, and I speak, I'm not speaking about God himself, please don't misunderstand me, but the way that we take care of that is to propitiate or bring a propitiation to those deities. Sadly, it even involved human sacrifices in some cases, you see. Now, this, uh, this word, propitiation, um, in the original language, the, the adjective form is hilaros. We get the word hilarious right from there. We've got to make, got to make, you know, the gods smile. We've got to make them be happy, okay? Now, what's interesting is that both the concept of wrath, and it's, there are various words for it, and the word propitiation are found in the Bible. So then the question is, must we understand wrath and propitiation as the nations around the Jewish people understood it, or is there a, se is there a special meaning in the Bible in this regard? Okay. These are big issues, and we're not going to, we can't take them up. I mean, whole books have been written on, on these issues. So we'll just touch on them lightly, okay? Along with, uh, to complicate things a little bit more, my understanding of Plato, the great philosopher, pre-Christian, before Christ, his notion of God may have been sort of a reaction to the concept of the, shall we say, the furies, the anger, anger, the angry gods, you know, and they may just lash out at any time, and you've got to keep them happy, okay? So his understanding of God is that God is immutable and impassable, which means that God is unchangeable and is without any feelings. He's just real steady, see? Real just steady. Impassable, without passion of any kind. And to Plato, apparently, wrath and anger were particularly unacceptable, wrath or anger, as it is a reaction and God does not react. That was apparently his thinking. God doesn't react. Anger is a reaction. Therefore, that in particular is just not acceptable. So, Bible students, in the, when I say the modern era, we're going back 100 years and more, have sort of come to the conclusion that while Paul retained the concept of wrath, and this is this particular theologian from England, um, C.H. Dodd, very, very influential. It is said that 
students in the seminary would say, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and strength and soul and thy neighbor, who is a German theologian, as thyself. They would kind of have a little fun. Very, very influential man, all right? So he said that while Paul retained the idea of wrath, it was not to describe the attitude of God to man, but to describe an inevitable process of cause and effect in a moral universe. In other words, it's just there. You do wrong, this is what happens. It's just kind of automatic in a, in a moral universe, see? It's not really God's feeling about you at all. And that, that has become very, very popular today. All right? So the, one of the main passages that this whole group of theologians rely on uh, or relies on is this passage from Romans chapter 1. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. All right? Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. So there is wrath. The wrath of God is revealed. But God's wrath is revealed in giving people up to the consequences of their choices. And that that is the extent of God's wrath. Just giving us up. Parents sadly have to do that with adult children that refuse to live by the principles that they learned as kids at home. Parents just say, well, we just got to give you up. And we've got to let you go. A friend told me that he came home one day and found his belongings all neatly packed in suitcases and waiting for him on the front porch. His parents said, you are no longer welcome here. Well, his life changed. <laughs> that was a big wake-up call. I've got to let you go. See? <laughs> all right. So God's wrath, then, is giving sinners up to the consequences of their behavior, an inevitable process of cause and effect in our moral universe. Well, I happen to believe in cause and effect. That's, there's a, it's a scientific principle. But I want to ask this question, who sets up the, co the, the cause, and fact, cause and effect continuum? Who put it together? Is there, is there a divine hand at all involved? Or is it just accidental, as our, some evolutionary friends would have us believe? All right? So, then, the idea of God's wrath needing to be propitiated by sacrifice, this is exceedingly distasteful to modern religious minds. See? So, now, if God's love and mercy are real in the Bible, then why are not his wrath and displeasure? That's the question I ask, all right? We're very comfortable with God, the idea of God's love and that God is merciful and long-suffering, forgiving, abounding in goodness and truth and so forth. Now, we may not like the negative side, shall we say, the, uh, his, his feelings of anger towards sin. We may not like that. But I ask this question, and I mean it. Why would, we, why, would, uh, why would there be the one and not the other? See, both are mentioned in the Bible. Both are there. Can we throw out the one uh, or try to explain it away and not the other? I don't think so. All right? Now, Moses And God are having a conversation about the Hebrew people because they built the golden calf and they're worshiping in an idolatrous manner such as they had seen back in Egypt. And, and uh, so um, in, the, in the course of this conversation, the Lord says, I have seen this people and indeed it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore, let me alone that my wrath 
may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, and I will make of you, that is of Moses, a great nation. Well, fortunately, Moses, bless his heart, the great man that he was, you know, he could have said, okay, that's fine. Well, it'll just be me and my family, and we'll be the big family. You know, we'll be the representatives of God on earth. But no, that's not what he did. He says, no, 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 don't do that, Lord. You know, <laughs> you're merciful, you're kind, and think of what the people around will say. Oh, you know, this, their God brought them out in the wilderness and then just slaughtered them. <laughs> so, so God went on to say that he would relent of his great anger. But it's because there was one who would intercede on behalf of that sinful people. See, we have an intercessor in heaven, Jesus. And we can flee to him in all of our sinfulness and ask him for mercy and forgiveness. And it's yours, it's ours, it's mine. All right? Human anger is usually arbitrary and uninhibited. I found this in the writings of one of my favorite authors. Divine anger is always principled and controlled. Our anger tends to be a spasmodic outburst aroused by peak and seeking revenge. God's is a continuous, settled antagonism aroused only by evil, and shall we say, it is evil that arouses his anger expressed in its condemnation. God is entirely free from personal animosity or vindictiveness. I'm not sure I agree completely with what John Stott is saying here, but I think he's making some good points, all right? God is entirely free from personal animosity or vindictiveness. Indeed, he is sustained simultaneously with undiminished love for the offender. God's or gi, or his wrath, is no nightmare of an, of an indiscriminate, uncontrolled, irrational fury, but the wrath of the holy and merciful God called forth by and directed against man's asaveya, which is his ungodliness, and his adikia, which means his unrighteousness. So God is a God of love, but when he sees that we are involved in rebellion and unrighteousness and ungodliness, and we're committed to that kind of a lifestyle, yeah, it upsets him because he is holy and cannot stand sin. All right? It is partly because sin does not provoke our own wrath that we do not believe that sin provokes the wrath of God. I like that statement a great deal. Found in the same book by Dodd. He's quoting one of his, uh, one of his friends. I like it. See, we think, well, you know, it's a, yeah, they're not, they're not doing right over here and, and that person over there and maybe even my own sinfulness is, eh, it's no big deal. So therefore, it's no big deal with God. But the fact is, it is a big deal with God. Sin is exceedingly sinful to our Heavenly Father. And as we will see, it caused the death of His Son. No other way to save the human race. See? So, the Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth. Moses had asked to see God's glory, so now he's telling Moses what his glory involves. All right, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but by no means clearing the guilty. That's part of his holiness. That's where his holiness shines forth, see. The guilty will not be forgiven if they continue in guilt. All right? Now notice what Moses did. Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. I think that's a good response for all of us as we study these issues. We may say, well, I don't fully understand. I don't, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not really sure that I'm comfortable with the idea of, of the wrath of God. All right? Well, Go back to the Bible, study it, study the theme. There are, there are many, you know, books that can help you. Even, I think you should be acquainted with those like Dodd who say, no, 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 there's no angering. I think you should be acquainted with those, uh, you know, the opposite view, so to speak. 
But my prayer is that as we study the characteristics of God and of his personality and his character, that it will lead us to do exactly what Moses did. And that is, we'll bow our heads toward the earth and worship. All right? You see, as we study the issue of sin, God's displeasure towards sin, we cannot help but notice that from the very beginning, it was God's plan to deal with sin in a way that would spare the sinner, even from the opening remarks of God after the fall of Adam and Eve, you see, there was a plan. God had a plan worked out to save those who were willing to be saved. And I love the words of Abraham as he took his son Isaac up on the hill. His son said, you know, here's the wood and here's the fire, but where's the offering? Where's the lamb for the offering? And Abraham said, as he even contemplates plunging a knife into his son's chest, unimaginable. See, God was testing him. And there was a, there's a lesson for Abraham to learn, for all of us to learn. Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb uh, for a burnt offering. Now, this burnt offering is very much tied with the idea of propitiation, you see. As you read in the, in the Old Testament, you'll find that the two, the offering and the pro pro uh, propitiation are very much tied together. So God is going to provide the propitiation. God is going to provide that which will, shall we say, deal with the issue of wrath in his own character, in his own mind. All right? The Old Testament sanctuary service where lambs were sacrificed and burned on the altar a fulfillment of that same promise. God will provide himself a lamb. No, the, the slaughter of animals and the burning of them on the altar did not forgive sins, but it pointed forward to the day when the true lamb of God would come, you see, and the issues of propitiation, God's wrath, would all be dealt with at Calvary. All right. My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, pointing forward to in fact, the sacrifice of Jesus. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Paul, in the third chapter of Romans, tells us, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. All right? Whom God set forth as a propitiation. All right? What does propitiation have to do with? Well, in, in the pagan world, propitiation is intended to make an angry God happy. Is that what's going on here? The answer is partly yes and partly no. I don't want to see it against the backdrop of paganism. But God has said, the soul that sins will die. In a sense, that's a statement that comes from his absolute hatred of sin and his wrath towards sin. But what is different about Christianity, first of all, is a great character of God, very different from the, and absolutely, absolutely different from the gods of the heathen, okay? That's for sure. But the methodology involved is also very different. Propitiation by the, in the other cultures and the other religions is man offering an offering to make an angry God happy. In Christianity, in the, in the message of the Bible, it is God who provides the propitiation. Huge different difference. The concept of his wrath is different from that of the pagan deities. And his method of achieving peace and harmony on this planet once again, very different from that of this, those religions. It is God who has provided, provided the, prop, the propitiation by the blood of Christ through faith. Now, it demonstrates his righteousness. In, his, in the past, he had passed over sins that were previously committed. 
you can hear Satan crowing and saying, <laughs> God promised to punish sin. He said the sinner will die. The sinner didn't die. God is too soft-hearted. He's not going to follow through. If, you know, he's just issuing a bunch of threats, and he's, not gonna, he's, just, he's just too chicken-hearted to, to follow through and really punish sinners. See, But God was waiting to punish sin in the person of his son. His son is the propitiation for our sin. And it's effective as we have faith in what his blood accomplishes to cleanse us and to draw us close to him. All right? Now, he demonstrates his righteousness now. He says, I am just, I am faithful to my holiness, to my purity, I will not forgive sin that is unrepented of. But now I can be the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. You see, so he was waiting for the day when his own son would bear the sins of the world, would be himself the propitiation. And now he can say to the universe, I am perfectly just before my own character, my law, everything that you expect of me because I have punished sin but now I can save the righteous and justify the repentant and those who, who understand and have faith in Jesus. It's a magnificent theme. A magnificent theme. All right. So all of sin, all are justified through the redemption that's in Christ. God sent him forth as a propitiation. So in a sense, yes, his wrath against sin was meted out on Jesus, who was himself the propitiation. Now God can be just to himself and his own law, and yet can justify those who have faith in Jesus. God's wrath is poured against sin is poured out on Jesus at Calvary. Propitiation is made for sin, not by man, but by God himself. All right, we read, for example, in 1 John chapter 2, he himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but for the whole world. So much for the idea that God only selects a few to go to heaven. Oh no, everyone has the opportunity to, be, to, be, to have faith in Jesus, to be cleansed and to be part of his family because he is the propitiation for the entire world. I take great comfort in that. All right, so let's read on. Now, do you think then, this is going on in Romans chapter 2, O oh man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same things, that you will escape the judgment of God. In other words, we're going on from the passage that said that the wrath of God is revealed. And God hands people over to the consequences of their sin, you see. That that's the only manifestation of God's wrath. That's what is alleged from Romans chapter 1. But in Romans chapter 2, the idea of wrath goes on. All right? Do you despise the riches of God's goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? In accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you're treasuring up for yourself wrath. In the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, his righteous judgment states this. Here's my law. Here is the way you've conducted yourself. And they are poles apart. I provided a way for you to be forgiven and to come into harmony with the principles of my law, and you have simply turned away from it. You've treasured up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish. Oh, I don't like those words. There it is. On every soul of man who does evil. Well, it might be argued that's just what goes on in the heart of the sinner. You know, he says, oh, no, I really did wrong, see? And that there's really no wrath on God's part. I hardly see that in this passage. I think the day will come when God's great displeasure against sin will be, will be deeply felt by all the wicked, and then they will be punished. They have been treasuring up wrath for that day. I don't want to minimize that. I don't think we should, all right? Now we're, gonna, we're getting down to the end here, and I want to 
bring you to the book of Hebrews. There's an appeal made by the author. I think it's Paul. See that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, back in the days of Moses, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I will shake not only the earth but heaven. Now this yet once more indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken as things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. And of course, those are the, the issues of salvation and God's love and God's plan, God's reward, all of that. You see, that can't be shaken. Everything else is going to be. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and fear. For our God is a consuming fire. There are Bible students, and I consider myself among them, who see the book of Hebrews as sort of a balance, counterbalance. Some people look at the Gospels and say, well, you know, Jesus is only kind. Well, he said some very strong things, but somehow those are overlooked with the idea he's, he's just very kind, and he is. But we cannot discount God's holiness and his absolute rejection and hatred of sin. Our God is a consuming fire. So, we'll look at one more Bible verse here. There we go, Matthew chapter 25. Just talk about it briefly. In the parable of the sheep and the goats, Jesus says to those who have not received him, depart from me. Oh, I don't like those words. But that's what he's going to say. You cursed into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil. Now the word everlasting here, the consequences are everlasting. The fire does not burn forever because God makes everything new, we're told. All right? But uh, man, I don't want to be on the wrong side of the fence when those words are spoken. Okay? So we read, The angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. All right? So, there are two harvests. Which harvest will I be part of? Which harvest will you be part of? We have no power to change our lives, but we have the power of choice. And if we choose to be Christ's, then he cleanses us and empowers us to live in harmony with his principles. All right? And if we don't make that choice, then we wind up, whether by choice or simply by neglect of making the choice for Christ, we end up in the, in the, in the tub full of grapes being trampled. Strong words, but I believe we need to take the, words of, of, uh, the word of God just as it reads and determine that the, the pictures of wrath will serve to remind us to remain in the love of God and within his boundaries and committed to his principles and his way of living. That's my prayer for you today. Father in heaven, the two harvests here at the end of Revelation 14 remind us of the sobering truths that there is a judgment coming. You do not like sin. You've made a way for escape from its guilt and its power through the death of your Son. Now lead us to see more fully your loving kindness and mercy and to study afresh the accomplishments of Jesus at Calvary and make our decision that we will stay with Jesus. We will choose to be his and will stay there by your mercy. So that when the day does come that Satan and his angels and all the wicked are trampled, burned, that we will be safely with our Lord and then enjoy the recreation of this earth. And uh, what a day that will be. Bless us to that end in Christ's name. Amen.
Have a good Sabbath day. God bless you this week. We'll see you again soon.